Morning. It's amazing to be together today because we went to um, the theatre to see Jesus Christ Superstar yesterday, which is amazing, but I was left yesterday with Jesus on the cross, which kind of isn't the end of the story. So it's been so good to come this morning and just think about what that did and how blessed we all are. So I'm really pleased to be with you. Thank you. And I'm really delighted to have been invited to speak to you about rest, which is something that I um, feel really passionately about. This may be a slightly meatier 15 minutes than it might have been ideal on an August hot morning, but I hope you'll hold on to me, hold on and chat with me. Um, so Jesus invites us to rest. In Matthew 11, 28, he says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So that's everybody who's weary, who's placed a load upon themselves, and everybody who's burdened, who's had loads placed upon them by other people. So I'm hazarding a guess it's pretty much everybody. And Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. But as I was preparing this and talking to the children about this this week, Winnie said that she was struggling to, my daughter said that she was struggling to follow along with me because she wasn't quite sure what rest meant in this context. Now, that was a strange question, because she's old enough to know what rest means, and, you know, family board game, or watching pottery throw down, or whatever, on a Saturday evening. But actually, I think, in what I was talking about, she'd got a sense that, the con in, within this context, in the biblical context, and what Jesus is promising us, it's something more. There's something richer and deeper than that, just sit down and have a bath, whatever, that kind of chilling out rest. Um, so what is this rest that we're talking about and what Jesus is talking about in that verse? The Amplified Bible expounds the word rest as describing it as relief, ease, um, refreshment, recreation, blessed quiet. And that really brought to, me, brought to mind for me the amazing words, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. And those amazing words from Psalm 23. And that, I think that depth, that richness, that renewal, as John was speaking about, the restoration of our soul is what Jesus is inviting us into. In Hebrews 4, it calls this rest his rest, referring to God. So it's saying that we can rest in the rest that God, sorry, um, referring to God. And so that rest we can see is his rest that he's inviting us into. It's the rest that began on day seven of creation. And when you've read the creation story, if you've done that, you might have noticed that when it's describing God's action on days one to six, the passage ends with the refrain, there was evening and there was morning the first day. There was evening and there was morning the second day. And that's all through days one to six. But on day seven, that doesn't happen. That refrain isn't there. And Bible scholars um, agree that that's because day seven continues throughout eternity. So that rest of God is something that he's still in. He's dwelling in that rest, and that's the rest that he's inviting us to join him in. So what an invitation it is. Um, Bible scholar Tim Mackey says to live in God's world is not just about production. It's about enjoyment. It's about receiving the gift of God's good world and his grace. It's resting. So this invitation is into a rest that is rich and deep. It's restoring of our souls. It's renewing. It's blessed quiet. And a really helpful metaphor that I found that just helped me to think about the difference again between those two rests was a quote just um, from a podcast panel member that I was listening to called Brian Roundsin. And he spoke about it. Uh, in terms of we're so thirsty for the goodness of God, but our desires are disordered, so we think that we can quench our own thirst with the salt water of Netflix or a hot bath or a holiday that we can sort of give ourselves. Whereas actually to quench that deep thirst, that longing within us, we need only the refreshment that God can bring, that fresh water that can renew and restore us. If God has commanded us to rest, as John spoke about last week, and invited us into this wonderful, restorative, refreshing of our souls, to delight with him in his good world, why are we not all living our lives from this place of rest? 
And through much study and my own exploration of this over the past few years, I've concluded that it's because it's really hard. And the author of Hebrews recognised that as well, telling us in um, chapter 4, verse 11, that actually to enter this rest, we need to labour, we need to make every effort, be diligent, strive. And it can seem really contradictory that we'd need to make every effort to enter rest. But our culture and our flesh tell us that we need to go, go, go. We need to be successful by being productive. We need to earn our place in the world by working and striving. But that's not the striving that we need. The Bible tells us that we need to strive to enter his rest. And to borrow from theologian Dallas Willard, he says we need to be ruthless in the elimination of hurry from our lives. We need to be diligent in our pursuit of this gift that God wants to give us and is inviting us to join him in. So what do we do? I'm drawing a lot on chapters 3 and 4 of Hebrews today, and I'd really suggest that if you um, would like to look into that and read those two chapters just over this time that we're studying rest, because it's really rich, it's really good stuff in terms of what this rest is and how we can enter into it. If you're anything like me, you might need to be ready for a bit of a challenge as well, though, I confess. Um, But in chapter 3, the author of Hebrews writes about a story from the Old Testament. We don't have time to go into the whole thing here. But they explain that the generation of God's followers, who he brought out of Egypt, he rescued them when they were enslaved to Pharaoh, they were unable to enter the Promised Land. Now, in the Old Testament, the Promised Land is a really common image for God's rest. So this generation were unable to enter God's rest, and that was due to their unbelief. Um, these, these people had just seen God perform numerous unquestionable miracles in their, say, in their um, salvation from their enslavers. So what on earth does it mean that they didn't believe in him? And the difficulty here, I think, is that the biblical image of rest, of, sorry, the biblical idea of belief is something quite different to our meaning of that word. So we think that believing in something means to mentally assent to its existence. So I believe that the moon is made of rock. But actually in the Bible, believing is not just hearing something and agreeing. It's when that agreement affects your actions deep down. Um, So in the wilderness, the Exodus generation's actions betrayed them. They weren't living with their faith and their trust in God. And so they were not allowed to enter his rest. The political philosopher Michael Novak breaks down belief in what I found a really helpful way, also really challenging, and you may be sensing a bit of a theme in terms of the challenge that I faced in preparing for this. It's got me deep. Um, But he suggests that we have three types of belief or three um, elements that we refer to as belief. And the first of those is our public convictions. So that's the things I'm happy to tell you that I believe in order to get you to think really well of me. So I want to frame myself in a particular way to the world, so I'm going to say that I believe in certain things. That's our public convictions. Our private convictions are things that we think we believe, or we think it's right to believe. So I think, absolutely, it's right to be generous. That's one of my private convictions. Underneath those, however, are core convictions. And these are the things that we really believe to the extent that they affect our actions. For example, if Gwynny offers me a plate of tiffin, I'm going to take the biggest piece, slightly undermining my real, honest, I do think I should be generous, but not then, just not with that. Um, So the problem that you can see is that our public convictions can be completely false advertising. Our private convictions can be fickle, and it's our core convictions that show what we truly believe and what we value. Now, I don't know about you, but if I examine my core convictions at the moment, particularly in light of thinking about rest, I know and I can see that when it really comes down to it, I believe in productivity and value productivity over rest and over love. Despite my best intentions and my genuine deepest desires, I currently live as if I don't trust God to have my best intentions at heart, as if my life is mine to control and not an immensely generous gift from my creator. So all of that to say, the biblical concept of belief is of a deep belief that influences our actions, a deep trust in God. And I, like those ancient Israelites, 
struggle with the unbelief that prevented them from entering God's rest. Thankfully, he is a patient and good God. And as Paul wrote to the Philippians, we can be confident that he who began a good work in us will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. In Tim Mackey's words, all we can do when we see the gap between what we think we believe and our actions is hold fast to Jesus. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. He's the one who paid the ultimate price that we may have life and have it to the full. So, in that acknowledgement of my brokenness and my lack of belief, what can we do with regard to this invitation to rest? Are we in despair or is there a way we can move forward? And we do what we can, I think. And what we can do is to choose to make space for God to work. We can turn off our tyrannical mobile phones. We can stand and wait quietly for the kettle to boil, rather than trying to fill that time with another job. We can choose to set aside time for Sabbath. And then we trust him to work in us, restoring us, renewing us, healing us, loving us into people who are free to rest in him. Because rest necessitates trust, as we've been talking about. Rest is full of unknowns. How will it work? What will I actually do? How will I get everything done that I need to get done? What will happen if I don't get it done? How will people cope without me? But actually, rest demands yielding. We need to trust God with the process, the circumstances, and the outcomes. It's a mystery. And we can try to control that mystery with worry, or we can welcome it and allow it the chance to be fun, and perhaps a little bit wild. I'm not a person who really does wild, but there is something really deep in me that thinks that could be quite fun and exciting. So this journey into rest might be hard. It might, it's likely to push us and stretch us. Depending on our personalities, we can get started with baby steps, or we can take a deep dive. But what I know is that God will honour everything we give him. And as we move forward into deeper trust of him, we will see his blessing. Whether our steps forward are small and hesitant, or bold and striding, we are moving forward. And what a gift we are moving forward into. An invitation to live with a restored soul. To live out of the knowledge that you are enough. To rest in the very rest of God. So, this week. Um, last week, John asked us to take the first steps as a community by taking an hour to rest. And I really hope you were able to do that. And whatever it looked like for you, whether it was a time of delight or whether some of the fears and difficulties that I've spoken about today may have arise, arisen in you, I'd really encourage you, because you have been obedient to God and you've responded to his invitation. And actually, this isn't about us. Whether we loved resting or didn't like it, it's not about us. It's about what God is doing in us and developing our trust in him. And whatever your experience of rest this week, you've stepped forward in that, and I really honour that. This week, I'd love for you to do the same again. So take another hour of whatever um, to rest in a way that feels meaningful to you. You could even extend it if you fancy. Um, but this time, there's a second element as well. And so I'm asking you to take time, either during that rest or another moment, to think about your reaction to his command and invitation to rest. Take a bit of time to sort of get real with, with your response to it. It may be that John's talk or mine today have stirred some feelings in you, or that the experience of resting last week gave rise to some surprising thoughts or emotions. It may be that as you even consider resting, practical objections just come flooding to the fore. Take some time to assess and identify these this week. And then I'd love it if you could write them down and share them with somebody who's going to journey with you into rest. It could be your partner, a friend, someone in your life group. But share your hopes and concerns with them. Hopefully maybe you'll be able to pray about it together too. Giving them to God and yielding to his plans for you as you move forward in response to his wonderful invitation.